It's about actually sharing knowledge and really giving insight. And I think it's also about liberating really uh, the idea of education. I mean, really giving anyone uh, in the world the possibility to learn about flexible design systems or creative coding. I think that's so amazing. I think there's a big chance in this um, uh, online learning, but there's also a big danger because everything that is digital is scalable. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain things that shouldn't be scaled and there are yeah. certain things that should be limited even though this limitation is artificial in the digital world. So by limitation you mean limiting basically the circle of people who are part of the group or what do you mean by that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you, you, you feel the presence of the people even though you're maybe not having a Zoom talk with them. You should somehow find a way to keep it human and to keep it limited to, um, to a manageable size so you mm -hmm. can still be in contact with these humans and have this exchange. You cannot just digitize a person and the people really need the contact, uh, at least to other learners, to make sure um, they, they grow and they have a physical experience. I think also that we now live in an age where the digital area or the digital level or layer, I would say, um, is kind of merging more with reality. Now I'm experiencing that kind of ex mixing more and more. So for instance, we are working for a theater in Freiburg and there was the idea, how can we actually use digital aspects um, in the play, but not lose the experience of being in the room with all those other people who are actually watching the play. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a super interesting question because it um, goes into all areas, digital, uh, also in teaching. I think this is a very dangerous situation as well because digitizing experiences like learning in a group or something can have consequences that we cannot oversee right now. I love the experiment and we will definitely also go into VR for my platform because I think it's really interesting, but always with a very skeptical, curious and courageous perspective. And if you think about technology and um, being a designer, what do you think, you know, looking a little bit in the future, how will technology change our role as a designer then? Tim and me, we talk a lot about um, mm. The, the technological aspect because, of course, there are enhancement of, of our human capa uh, capacities. But um, um, to a degree that is scary. We are forced to use this new technology which uh, drives us well, us to, to, to perform at a pace that doesn't let us reflect on the technologies that we're using anymore. So we don't do risk uh, evaluations of the new technologies that we're doing because we don't have the time. Mm, we have exactly. to be ahead of our competitors or at the same speed of our um, competitors. Yeah, it's really, especially also for studios and agencies, it's really important to uh, see ourselves more as consultants and maybe even philosophers who have the ethical aspects of AI and all these tools in mind, right? It's really, really important because uh, AI is a mass destruction weapon, really. I mean, it can destruct the way how we communicate. The problem with these technologies is that they don't have an ethical um, understanding of what is right and what is wrong. In the mind of a creative person, there's always this um, aspect of curiosity as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, for me at least, it's always about you know trying out new things, playing along with them and really understanding them to a certain extent and then pr probably also interviewing them and um, through that technology being able to actually learn new areas uh, which wouldn't have been possible before because now I can write text, I don't know, a hundred times faster than before and this will actually help me to find new ground. So uh, I, I, I see what you're saying. On the other hand, I think um, at a certain point or now it's just a tool in a way and it's, yeah, sure. it's something where you can play around and find new ways of creativity in a way. Absolutely, yeah. But I think this, I mean, it's um, technology makes our lives easier, but I think it also makes us lazier. And I think that's a huge problem of uh, humanity, that we are so lazy that we're trying always to find the shortcut in anything. And this uh, forces us to unlearn things that we learned before. It's like the Google brain that we have now. We don't need to know anything anymore because we can always go to Google and just uh, read up on what we were knowing before but forgot already. Mm -hmm. And the same thing I fear as well is going to happen with AI. If AI is so good to write my 
uh, text, my article, my Wikipedia article, my website, any kind of text, we unlearn to write, which means as well we unlearn to think, because thinking and writing is deeply connected. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid of this, and that's why I'm also very skeptical about um, uh, teaching AI at universities, because I think especially learning requires a lot of failure, a lot of thinking, and if we outsource thinking, I think we're on a, on a path that is doomed. And I think it's, it's, yeah, we're losing a lot of quality uh, in the learning process and the teaching as well. I totally agree, yeah. It's a good point. On the other hand, I would argue that, you know, AI also can be an aim uh, for having more experiences in a way. So I think some parts of your life, as you said, can be made easier and faster. Uh, and therefore, maybe you will be open to experience more in other directions. I know what you're meaning with becoming more lazy, but at the same time, I think it's freeing up time to do other things. Mm -hmm. And um, don't you think so? First of all, I gotta say that I don't like this word experience because that's an argumentation by Mark Zuckerberg. This is how he sells his products. He says it's all about experiences. Human, we all want to have new experiences. We have so many experiences, right? I mean, the, 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 what we have right now is so many options. From my point of view, we don't need new experiences. And talking about experience as well, it's like we over... Um, just by our drive of growing and learning new things and making new things um, and this almost religious belief in that the new thing is the good thing and is going to solve somehow a problem that we had. We don't even know if we had this problem. We just assume that this new technology is built to solve an old problem. Exactly. But we don't think about the new problems that we are uh, creating by this yeah. and I think that especially in design I sometimes don't get it anymore because we were supposed to be a profession that solves problems yeah. but by our atomistic view on our parameters of the problem we're creating so much new problems that are out of our focus yeah we solve problems that are not really important anymore right now we have completely different problems that we have to tackle and those problems often come from technology um, I'm absolutely not a, not a pessimist about technology, absolutely not. I love technology. I of, I've always been tinkering with any kind of tech, but it also makes me very, yeah, very skeptical, I think. And this is what I would try to teach my students in the end, I guess. Being more skeptical about what we do with technology and understanding the basic patterns, the basic principles, and getting a more reflective view, maybe, and along the way, they create amazing visuals. <laughs> and that's uh, yeah. something I love to do. Yeah. yeah, 100%. I mean, as I said, I think also to really understand it, you really have to try it out. And you have to go deep into it to maybe be then uh, reflective of it and maybe um, create some criticism around it and so on and, and get the bird's eye view. What I really like about your teaching, Martin, is that you teach uh, people to think in systems. This could be a very nice solution because system thinking enables you to think um, in an abstract way of very complicated things and also consider the relations between all these um, different points. The, the system thinking awareness is an awareness that wants to uh, try to move us from an atomistic view of the world to a holistic view of the world. But I think there's thinking in how um, our world works, the world of the algorithm, can make us as well more aware of the things that we Absolutely. see, yeah, the true. things that we see, especially in social media, the, yeah. the things that are all filtered, um, why we think in a certain way, because of the sources that we access, and these are controlled by algorithms. Yeah. So I think this is an important lecture as well. But I mean, yeah, you have to understand those systems, right? So I always wonder, uh, now, me being a designer at heart, like how do you start with things like that? Well, my starting point is, um, comes more from the crafts. So I was interested in how to do things in a systemic way so I can save time and do more complex projects and um, don't think so much in the applications that I need to design, but in a system that allows me to create lots of different kinds of applications in a quite short time period. 
but this is like the gateway drug for me. In the moment that I understood the principles that are behi behind designing with systems, I understood that the same principles you could apply to different disciplines as well. So I think starting with something like craft, like designing things, uh, open up a whole new way of seeing the world as well. Um, and that's, I think, for me, for me, like learning is something that I really enjoy and I want to do this until the rest of my life and then teach what I learned. So having this chance of starting somewhere that I'm familiar with design and then exploring new fields is a joy, even though sometimes the things that you discover are very scary. But how do you do that? I mean, Max, when you have something new you want to explore, how do you approach those new things? Yeah, completely conceptual in the beginning, really mm -hmm. about writing. I mean, as you said, maybe in the beginning, it's all about writing. I'm, I'm trying to scope all the different aspects is, um, of it. And then I, I really think um, in worlds. So for instance, when I'm designing a brand or whatever, I'm always trying to think about, you know, basically an environment, the trees in that world, the buildings, um, the cars, and they would look different. And, you know, the typography, everything around it. So I would think about everything, which is not <laughs> the brand. And then um, I, I kind of have an inner feeling and an understanding of the world the brand lives in, for instance. And then I'm trying, uh, trying to do the design for it. So it's more about that, trying to generate, um, I don't know, assumptions of a certain direction something can be and a world where something can live in, basically creating a universe. But that's an system environment. thinking, because that's contextualizing what you're doing. So you're thinking about the environment that your design is going to live in. So this is already a system thinking. Yeah, and also I'm, I'm thinking about the problems really, and we have to solve them with this brand. Like whom do I talk to, like um, who are maybe other players in the game, um, and in which world do we live, and um, where will we be in maybe two, three, five years uh, with this, even if it's a topic to, to think about it. But um, yeah, it, it kind of opens up the, the brain, and then I'm always thinking about this um, kind of, uh, how do you say, filter, I don't know, um, kind of thing. Um, in the beginning, really broad, everything's allowed. I'm trying to play a lot, experiment, um, generate ideas. And then uh, once I have the concept written down, I go deep in one with one idea, really, really deep. And then once I have this, then I go broad again and try to, you know, design all measures, for instance, or something like that. Yeah. But I mean, I'm also programming since I'm seven. So I, oh, I nice. really, <laughs> awesome. yeah, yeah, I started um, programming um, quite early with super simple HTML stuff. Then later on in school, I did like the um, complete school websites and so on mm -hmm. for this, uh, um, for, for my class and so on. And then I started uh, with creative coding as well. But I think just the, the, the code mindset is a little bit interesting because you really have to scope out what you want to do in the beginning, but then in the end, the output when you work with creative code can be so playful and, yeah, totally. and so much experiment. I you love that. You create a little machine that is able to generate a world. Yeah. And by tweaking a few parameters, it gets a different world. I really love that. It's really an interaction with the computer, which I really enjoy. Yeah, and it's also a style of writing. I think you can read who wrote what, which kind of um, code, like the style of someone uh, who writes code. So in the end, uh, I always have the question, is you know, the code more or less the artist or you know, the, the coder himself or herself? Because, yeah, I don't know, it, it kind of goes hand in hand, obviously, on the one hand. But on the other hand, I think it's also funny that we, as someone who create code, are giving away the last piece of it, which is really creating the, you know, mm. the last part in a way. But that's a, Generating the that's a great question because <laughs> I think um, currently when we think about AI, for example, then we give a lot of the decisions to the computer. Mm. But in creative coding, it's really about creating a system where you have the choice how much control you want to give the computer, maybe the user of the uh, application, uh, or even make it, it all random and all computer generated or based on data or whatever. And that's something uh, I find super interesting. For instance, GitHub is like this huge community where you can share code and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, a lot of people are also open sourcing their code and giving away, away the kind of their intellectual property in a way. On the other hand, it's your handwriting and your signature and then other people are kind of mingling around with it. It's almost like, I don't know, in a, 
in a crazy example, Van Gogh would teach you know everyone how to do exactly his um, brush stroke, and then people are trying um, to go with it, starting there. And uh, do you have a problem with that? To be honest, I'm quite open-minded for people that use my code for their projects because. I mean, I teach them a method and when they apply this method, I cannot say like, hey, this is my method, this doesn't make any sense. And I love to see people working with it. But what I don't like is when people start to copy my business model. But also I try to keep my view and my perspective onto the amazing people that I have in the community that do their own thing with my work. It's also a lot about trust, right? They trust me, I trust them. I try to maintain contact to some of the people that really stand out, which is really amazing. I meet them sometimes when I give real workshops. And this is so cool to see how these people, some of them really evolve over time. And you see that they implement creative coding into their life, into their business. They, maybe one of them, uh, Fred, just uh, decided to become a developer now because he was really an amazing creative coder. And he did something completely different in the beginning, before when he started with my courses. So this really influences decisions that really um, <laughs> where kind of the, 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 the directions that he takes in life. And this is something that moves me very much. You grow together. I mean, that's the thing, yeah. right? You, you find like-minded people, you have the same interests exactly. in a way, and then you, you also have the feeling, digital or not, that you're going through a certain period of your life together. Yeah, I was also wondering, do you think learning is collaboration in a way? Because you were also saying you learn so much from your students. I think it should be mm. collaboration. But um, I think that um, this requires as well um, a certain kind of mindset that not everybody has. I think that you have to learn to be a good student, also to be a good student as a teacher, and uh, to be able to switch in these different kinds of roles and have this um, idea of I'm coming to give and I'm coming to receive, but we can all uh, contribute with a different kind of perspective. In Bielefeld, I had a very nice uh, collaboration with Florian Gubernator, who was a former student of mine. He studied physics and had a master in physics, and I have no idea about physics and math. I'm very bad in math. I would say I'm much better in programming than in math, but I didn't know what the modular operator actually does and how it works, and I wanted to do a course on it. And we had a, about a, a half an hour long conversation in the class and he taught me how it works. And the students were like, huh? what's going on here? He's a student now, right? And um, I was thinking about changing my seat and going into the roles of the students. Um, I love that. I love that, playing that role, Be becoming a student myself. It's really, really nice. Yeah, it's super interesting how probably this also becomes more or less a tool of you yeah. um, or in your teachings, how you can actually create scenarios where someone actually feels uh, that he or she can, you know, share their knowledge um, towards you. I completely agree that the, the teacher has to um, be a student as well, but I think there has to be something that makes you as well the teacher. I don't think that you should just repeat knowledge that you have learned and accept it as the ultimate truth that will be valuable for everyone and forever. Um, I think you need to change as well. Um, but I think the teacher should have somehow the function of a glue that keeps it all together. So when I teach systems, I'm aware that uh, we can teach the same kind of principles, but the way how they use them can be very different. So when I'm seeing someone doing 3D, for example, I find it really exciting that uh, the person besides is working with scissors um, because um, they show that the same principle works for different kinds of tools, but also they help me see as well to which ideas they are coming by using different kinds of tools. And I found out that um, the tools very much influence as well the learning process. I always try to think about architecture. If you think about really old architecture, let's say brutalism or whatever, it's not that old, but I mean, they developed a new method of um, using concrete and so on, and therefore the forms completely changed. Now just being, being aware or becoming aware of the tools we have, and then maybe even programming your own tools, um, I think that's a super interesting part of being a designer. And that's why I also love really writing code because it's basically generating a complete own toolset. But you know, just being aware about the systems 
or the tools which actually generate also part of the output is super important, I think. And then switching those tools from time to time, maybe even trying to go into completely new areas uh, to generate new tools, I don't know. The tool can um, already have the, the whole uh, identity in it and you can play with it and give it give it out to people that actually don't know how to use the Adobe Creative Suite. And this is what I like about tools as well. I mean, the one thing that you mentioned I find very important for identity designers, that um, it's like the new kind of design manual. You don't need to interpret any rules anymore because they're embedded into the code mm -hmm. and you can pass it on to your clients and they can't do much wrong or they can interact in, their, in the parameters that you decided. On. But the other thing that I find very valuable, and now with artificial intelligence even more, is that you want to have this humanness in it. And I think the, the mm -hmm. things that I'm also seeing that excite me the most is to have something in it that you can't really explain. I just always wonder because I'm, I'm, you know, I have an agency, we have people here working for clients and so on. How do you apply something like that? Not just within the agency, but when you pass on the identity to your clients. For instance, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's a whole design question in itself, how your identity is going to, or how your system is going to be applied. I think you have to have um, in mind already, or you have to know as well, with which structure you're working, in which context your design has to work, mm. and how you have to pass on this system to them. Maybe this, even if the brand manual is interactive and is online and they can download the different assets and work with them. This is still not everything that you need. You need these rules of how to apply it. Yeah, that's always the problem with kind of generating those systems and then, I don't know, seeing as a designer how they kind of live on yeah. <laughs> and trying to, I don't know, navigate that maybe yeah. a little bit. But then in the end, sometimes it also gets butchered or whatever. Totally. Yeah. It's way more important to actually guide the client and to think through their heads or whatever, at their shoes and be there as a guidance um, in terms of where can we, you know, be in a few years, what do we need to do to get there? Mm -hmm. and, and then I will get all the tools necessary together for that client and there will be certain aspects which I can't do. I mean, especially in coding, there are so many languages. The yeah. setup you need nowadays to do a web project is insane yeah, if you think also about the it. People, right? <laughs> it's a big, big problem, I guess, also in agencies because they often, I guess, really would benefit from a nice team of creative coders, but yeah. the problem is that they are quite rare and because you, you, need, you need quite a lot of knowledge also on what's possible, what languages you should use for certain use cases. And um, then you come to the problem that you have to gather these people in a city and stuff. So it's really a big, big uh, difficulty, I guess. I mean, I'm, we did a project now where we generated basically 10,000 NFTs with Python scripts. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, pre-selected them based on a database and stuff like that. So I would say that's also generative coding, Absolutely, but just yeah. on a different 100%. level. Um, and I did a lot of coding there and it was a lot of fun. But uh, um, for a client itself, I, I think that's the what, that, that's the end product, the kind of the, the end result. I'm more interested in um, thinking about the why and, and trying to yeah, you know, navigate there. And then I see who, ha who we need or what we need um, to get there. And um, I just am super interested in, in general in that aspect because I mean, I'm doing creative coding since many years. And I think this whole area has a lot of um, there's a lot of fear attached to it, to starting out. Yep. And I, I want to be a catalyst for the community in a way that I bring more people to the table and think it's such an interesting idea of using actually more or less algorithms and design systems or coded systems to generate visual output um, and writing your own tools uh, that would help a lot of designers um, to develop more, uh, more rigid uh, tool set in a way or creative spectrum or whatever. And um, that's why we are also doing, for instance, this creative coding atlas, because I also think there's so many cool people out there who are doing this kind of stuff. It's an amazing and initiative. I really love it. It's really cool. Yeah, and it's, it's such a small community, but it's slowly, very slowly growing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but it's, 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 nice. Like it's, a, it's a nice name, I think, if you have like, uh, it's atlas as well in it.
Yeah. It means like um, creating a, a map no, for mm -hmm. um, like-minded uh, people also that have the same kind of focus as well. Cartographing, the, mapping the, the scene is really nice. Yeah, like yeah, and then in the end, really, um, it's about then not only cataloging, but obviously giving more uh, in a way, and maybe giving away tool sets, maybe giving away uh, knowledge to other teachers and so on. And I, I think that's really the way. Um, I mean, we've been talking about that a lot now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> about the whole community aspect. Yeah. I mean, looking forward a little bit in, in, in the next year or so, I think you were talking a little bit about the collaboration between the two of you guys. Is there <laughs> something you can, you can plug? I'm super curious what you have planned for the next year coming up. Yeah, basically we are talking a lot about an intersection of our teaching style or of our teaching in general. And uh, because we just, I gotta say that when I learned to know Martin, I knew him from books back in 2007 or something. He was like a very famous designer for me and we came in touch through, I guess, your dissertation uh, when you yeah. asked me to, to uh, send you a copy of a book, mm -hmm. which was really interesting. And I always followed his way of um, his slowly, let's say, um, evolving uh, theory also that you became more and more systematic. And that's something I observed and I was also very interested in elementary design, like the very design basics, which is also a very systematic way on looking onto design. And now uh, we have so many, we had so many discussions and talks and we're just kind of trying to fuse our ideas. We won't tell too much about it, but I'm super, super confident about a, a massive drop next year. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to, 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 to put it out there. Yeah, me too. I, I think the interesting thing is that we often we talk with different words about similar things. Yes. And exactly. people understanding that we are actually talking about the same kind of things will benefit them a lot. So we don't want to lose our signature interests or subjects, but we want to create more synergies to yeah. also get a fusion in between the different kinds of worlds that we're coming from. And I think a lot of things that we always talk about are like mental blockages that people have, like certain things that they don't grasp or don't understand because certain terminology has been used or certain images has been used in the past Metaphors. to explain these subjects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we want to break this a little bit free and as well show the potential of it. And, and that's very exciting also because uh, I'm learning a lot from Tim as well because um, he's already for three years doing online courses. Uh, and, and this whole kind of teaching, uh, being in close contact with communities, uh, doing this digitally, also doing it in a different way, like um, learning by doing and seeing the whole um, publication process as a process, which people also can see as a process, is very interesting to me. I have to learn as well as of the experience that uh, Tim had and also that people that he knows as well, that you find a healthy rhythm for yourself. Also because I think that you're tempted to publish too much and to reflect too less. And I want to reserve the time to properly research something and to properly formulate something before I publish it. And don't have this system in my head. I really got to put out their content because this content is going to be shit if I don't take my time. Yeah, I'm very qualified to teach these things because I experienced all the massive shit you can experience when you be completely overworked and uh, I had a hearing loss last year, like, uh, what, which was kind of, I don't know, it really was really bad. But I think it's also a very nice tool to train and to learn patterns and uh, yeah, behavior that ends up in a very proactive character. And I really embrace proactivity. I think proactivity is the most valuable skill. Uh, following all my own intrinsic goals, my own way, and not being, let's say, led by, an, um, yeah, by a system, again, that, that, that wants me to be reactive. And I think it's a really nice school for my own life. 
I love that mindset because in a way it's it's also com uh, connected to what you said you don't really know how it will be in the end but I mean you're just learning so much by trying and failing and failing and trying and failing and actually having maybe a lot of fun by it uh, by doing it and then in the end you have produced a lot more in a way than just thinking I don't know weeks and months um, about it even with this series for instance we were thinking I was thinking um, I don't know months about it until we did it and then we just said from one morning to the other we said like okay in two weeks we're gonna do our first show and then we did it and everyone was like oh my god there's so much stress <laughs> yeah. but then we just did it you know a few first live shows uh, through instagram and it was so cool it was completely natural and we knew ah, okay we want to proceed and um, actually keep doing this yeah sure Cool, guys. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for taking your time and um, jumping on the sofa. It was a blessing to have you guys here. And uh, yeah. Thank you so thank much you. for the invitation. Yes. And uh, yeah, it was, it's a great experience to be in Munich and meet you guys. <laughs> cool. <laughs>